lecture by Jared Weinstein. Good. And I'm told to remind you to drink what? Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Everything's on? No, you can't hear me? Now you can. All right. Well, uh, today we're going to take a detour away from attic spaces, and we're going to talk about perfectoid fields. Very exciting. So the topic of today is perfectoid fields. Why do we have to know about perfectoid fields? Well, they're perfectoid spaces with one point. We'd better understand the case of one point. So definition, let's start right away. Throughout this entire discussion, P is a fixed prime number. And let's suppose K is a non-Archimedean field. Oh. Field of residue characteristic. P, right? And what does that mean? Well, K is a field, and it's complete with respect to a non-Archimedean metric. And I'm going to call that metric absolute value, and it is real valued. OK. So I call K perfectoid. K is a perfectoid field. If, OK, two conditions. So one is that the value group of k, of the unit group of k, should be non-discrete. Which means that k is not going to be the field qp of p-adic numbers. That value group is cyclic. It's just z. Whereas the value group of k has to be big. <laughs> OK. So um, k is something very, very ramified. If it's characteristic zero, it's something very, very ramified over QP. And the second property is something like resembles the condition for a ring to be perfect. If I look at the Frobenius map, which I'll denote by phi, OK. So this K circ, or K upper zero, just like yesterday, it's the bounded, power bounded elements of K, but that's often, that's just called the ring of integers of K. It's often denoted OK, but for consistent, consistency's sake, it's K, K upper zero here, right? So I want this map to be surjective. OK. So elements of K zero, you can extract P roots of them, at least modulo P. And this is true for the field QP as well, but as I said, part A excludes QP from being a perfectoid field. All right. So just as a remark, I never said anything about K being characteristic zero. K could well be characteristic P. And if it is, the characteristic of K is, perf is P, then what is B saying? Well, P is 0 in K. And so B is just saying that the Frobenius map is just surjective on K, but it's a field, so it has to be an isomorphism. So K would have to be perfect. So K, B says K is perfect. Thus, um, and so this actually implies the condition A. It makes A redundant. So for a non-Archimedean field of characteristic P, K perfectoid, if and only if k perfect. Right? Good. So uh, excellent. What are some examples of perfectoid fields? So we saw some of them in, in Peter's introductory lecture, right? So the most basic examples are the following two p-adic fields. You can take qp, but I want to make it a lot bigger by passing to a very ramified extension. For instance, I could add all p power roots of unity. Uh, but then I need to complete this to make it a non complete non-Archimedean field, so there you go. And if you take the ring of integers in this, so here's this. This ring of integers is just this completion. And then modulo p, you'll see very clearly that you can extract p roots from this, because all p power roots of unity themselves have p roots. Okay. Another example is, well, we took p -th power roots of 1 here, but we can also take p -th power roots of p. So let me notate it this way. So that's as it stands an algebraic extension of qp, but then let me p-adically complete it, and there you go. 
and you can guess what the ring of integers is. Um, other examples maybe become may become more organically. What I can also do is um, take k to be qp, and I adjoin. Hey, well, this was torsion in some algebraic group, but I can pick a different algebraic group, such as an elliptic curve, and complete this, where e over qp is an elliptic curve, and um, that's just one instance of a very broad source of perfectoid fields known as arithmetically profinite fields. This was the class first studied by Fontaine and Vanton Perger in their study that predates the def modern definition of perfectoid fields. I better give you a characteristic P example, right? So here's one. Um, the residue field will be FP. And then uh, to make it non-Archimedean, I could start by introducing a Laurent series field. There's a Laurent series field. It's non-Archimedean of characteristic P, but then I have to make it perfectoid, which means I have to make it perfect. So I'd better adjoin all pth power roots of this, and then it has to be completed once again. <laughs> so I need to take a t-adic completion of this. And if you like, you can work out what exactly this is. What does it mean to be a member of this field? It's some fat, fractional power series in T. It's Laurent, so it has negative powers of t, but that's nothing too crazy. But um, it still has to be, a, in a sense, the um, number of non-zero coefficients attached to an exponent below a given bound has to be finite. Okay. Now, some pitfalls in working with the, the realm of possible exponents here is this non-discrete thing, so you have to be a bit careful. OK, little lemma working with these. Whatever the value group is, so this is some subgroup of the positive real numbers, and this group is p divisible. Right, you can always extract a pth root um, from an element of the value group, and I can prove this quite easily. Let me choose an element x in the ring of integers, and I can choose this element to have value lying strictly between p and 1. Right? So x is like bigger than p. It could be something like a square root of p, uh, but still be uh, in the maximal ideal of the ring of integers. And I can do this precisely because part a says the valuation is non-discrete. There has to be something in between. And once I do this, so this is by a, and then by b, there exists, I can extract a pth root of this, modulo p, so there exists an element y, okay, circ, such that you know y to the p is congruent to x mod p, but that just means this. Right. And then by the non-Archimedean property, what's the valuation of y? Well, it's the pth root of the valuation of y to the p, which has to be exactly the same as x. So we get this. So there you have it. You can extract pth roots of elements of the value group so long as they lie in this range. Um, to get all elements of the value group, we'd better include elements like this one. But that's OK. p itself is x times p over x. And both of these elements are of this form. And so you can extract pth roots to these elements. And therefore, you can do it with p. And so p, together with elements x of this form, generate the entire value group. And so you can take pth roots of everything. OK. Good. OK. Keep that in mind. The next topic is tilts. In yes. There is a completeness assumption. Um, maybe definitions differ, but my definition of non-Archimedean field includes complete. All right. Okay. All right. So tilt. So in Fontaine's original work, you have some very ramified extension of QP, and you produce from it a non-Archimedean field of characteristic P, and then rather shockingly conclude that two Galois groups are isomorphic. That's what. 
as Peter mentioned in his very first talk. And um, Peter's work on perfectoid spaces and also Kedlai Liu really systematizes this into what we now call tilting. So given a perfectoid field K, What we do is we create a new field, but a priori, it's just going to be a set. <laughs> Why don't I take this inverse limit along where the transition map is just x goes to x to the power of p. I mean, hey, I can do this with any ring whatsoever. What I get is a multiplicative monoid. Fine. And uh, well, very explicitly, this is a set of sequences, x0, x1, etc. Each one is an element of K, and each one is a piece power of the one that came before it. And uh, just a multiplicative monoid, but what you can actually do if K is a perfectoid field is turn this into a ring, at least, by supplying an addition law. Here is that addition law. You know, in Peter's uh, introductory talk, he mentioned that he arrived at this formalism using some very advanced machinery and avoided calculations. Okay, well, here are those calculations. So xi plus yi, how do you add two elements here? Well, I've got to get a third element, call it zi, and so now I have to tell you what zi is. It's a limit, and that's why it's important that perfectoid fields be complete. This limit has to converge. Limit as m goes to infinity. So uh, xi plus m plus yi plus m, and then raised to the power of p to the m. OK. So it's a, whatever limit I've wrote down, it's a fun exercise to show that it converges. The basic idea behind this exercise is that raising to a pth power makes, makes congruences stronger, modulo p. OK. I mean, you can see already that modulo p, you're not doing anything. You're just saying, I mean, on the first coordinates, you just get x0 plus y0 equals z0. Okay. But in fact, this addition law makes k flat or k tilt into a field. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is actually give um, a norm or an absolute value on k tilt as follows. First, I'm just going to introduce a piece of notation here. There's a map from k tilt to k in the kind of other direction, which is just projection onto the zeros coordinate. So an element f will go to. So if f is x0, x1, et cetera, then that will go to f sharp. And this is just the first coordinate, x0. Okay. So that projection onto the first coordinate will be called sharp, f to f sharp. And <clears throat> and for an element of the tilted field, I let, oops, I let the absolute value of f be just the absolute value of f sharp. And at the very least, I know that an element has absolute value 0 in this field if and only if it is 0. So it has some chance of being a norm. But in fact, it is an ultrametric norm on this field. And that turns it into a complete non-Archimedean field. And in fact, it is a perfectoid field. So in fact, k tilt is a perfectoid field of characteristic p. Right. So if you haven't done this exercise before, it's really fantastic. It's not so clear that this even, you know, that this ring satisfies the ring axioms. Uh, but in fact, it does. And the most efficient way to see that is not to define k tilt this way, but rather to do a slight variation on it. So um, to see this, um, let's. Uh, Let's say the following. Inside of k tilt, 
which is the inverse limit along k. I could also just do the inverse limit along k, the in ring of integers of k under the same transition map, right? So this is certainly a subset of this. And then this projects onto the inverse limit along Frobenius. The transition maps here are all the same, but here I'm going to put k ring of integers modulo p. And now this right here is a ring of characteristic p, and so Frobenius is a ring homomorphism there. And so this, with no trouble whatsoever, is a ring at least. In fact, it's a perfect, no, it, well, yeah, it's a perfect ring, you can check. So certainly Frobenius is going to be surjective on this thing, rather by design. So what, what have we done? This, this mysterious k tilt has some subset, and that subset maps onto something which is a ring. We're trying to show that this is a ring, and here's this subset of it. But guess what? This is actually an isomorphism. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's an isomorphism a priori just of multiplicative monoids. Which is remarkable. What we've done is we've modded out by something, so how could this possibly be an isomorphism? Well, that's part of the magic of working with perfectoid objects that works this way. For, well, yeah, maybe I should just leave this to you as an exercise. It's really fun. For injectivity, for instance, what happens if you go to zero here? Well, okay, we've got a sequence, and then it turns out all of the coefficients, all of the members of that sequence are divisible by p, but also, it's p power compatible, and this forces the zeroth term of the sequence to be infinitely divisible by p. And in fact, in for, it, it, it means all of the terms of the sequence will be infinitely divisible by p, it just has to be zero. All right. And so then what do we get here? We find that uh, as a result, this thing is at least a ring. And then how do we recover k tilt from it? Well, it's this inverse limit, this ring of characteristic p, but then I've got to invert something, a particular element, call it pi. And uh, what is this pi? Pi is just going to be some element uh, whose absolute value is between 0 and 1. And one. If you like, so it's, it, you may choose this, this is sort of common, so that the absolute value of this pi, which is, by the way, defined to be just the absolute value of the sharp, this can be the same as the absolute value of p. And I can do this because um, of this lemma. This absolute value is p divisible, and it turns out I can cook up a sequence of compatible elements with this absolute value. And so what have we done? I know this went rather fast. We had some unidentified k-tilt. A priori was a multiplicative monoid, but it contains something, which is a perfect ring of characteristic p. And then you can check that you recover the whole thing just by inverting a single element. All right. I'd better do an example. It is completely analogous to what Fontaine does. Yeah, yeah, he, he called, instead of, the notation is different though. He, instead of k tilt or k flat, he wrote r for this ring. And he also introduced a class of imperfect rings, imperfect, what, sorry, what are they called, imperfect? I don't know. But we're only considering these perfect rings of characteristic p. Okay. Sure. Oh, right, so this projection, oh, let me, since this is being recorded, I should move it. Right, the question was, what kind of map is this? So this sharp map, which just projects onto the first coordinate. So it is a map of multiplicative monoids, this is homomorphism of multiplicative monoids. And by design, it preserves the absolute value, but that's about all I can say. It certainly is not additive nor, in general, will it be surjective. It's not clear that given an x0, I can find a p root and a p root of that and so forth. Um, 
it, that would be true if k were algebraically closed, but it may not be. Right, so three, okay. So some examples of tilts, so let's start. Here's one, let's, let's start with the perfectoid field obtained by joining all piece roots of P. Uh, let's work out what the ring of integers is. Uh, well, it's just ZP to join. All piece roots of P, and then completed. And I'm going to follow along in this other interpretation of what the tilt is, okay? So let me mod out by P. Actually, before doing that, let me identify this with something more abstract. It's a polynomial algebra over ZP, where I extract all possible piece roots. And I, 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 could, I could also, I, I guess I could theoretically complete this and call this power series. But then let me mod out by <laughs> T equals P. No harm in doing that. What happens when I mod this mess out by P? Well, the ZP becomes an FP. And um, adjoining all P roots of some variable T, but then this ideal, the P goes away, I'm just modding up by T, and then the power series just become polynomial. And that's very, that's, that seems not so complicated. Notice how the role of the variable P has been, the role of P has been kind of shoved aside in favor of something more abstract, this variable T. And that's something that we're doing. We're divorcing P from its role as one plus one plus one P times in favor of an indeterminate. Okay, here's this algebra on which Frobenius is surjective. So why don't I just take an inverse limit under the Frobenius map? Okay, what happens here? The inverse limit here. Great, so uh, what's the transition map? Well, it's, um, it's the map that just sends everything to its pth power, so it has the effect of turning t into t to the p, but you know, I could just relabel things so that the nth ring in this sequence is this one. And then the transition maps here are more like the reduction mod more like the identity. <laughs> so here it's the transition maps of Frobenius, and here, oh, P to the end, there we go. I, I don't know if it's clear what I've done. This is an inverse system of rings, and I've replaced the nth ring of that inverse system with this one, just by sending T to T to the P to the N. I've changed the rings, and accordingly the transition map has changed, but it's changed into something quite simple. Now it's just reduction. And doing this, well, all this does, it just theoretically completes this polynomial algebra. And so it becomes FP power series T1 over P infinity. Great. Now, this, what is this? This is, this is by definition the theoretic completion of the polynomial ring, this one. So if you like, this is definition of this ring. But you could also write it down in these, as, as fractional power series subject to some restraint, all the terms below t to the n, there should only be finitely many of them. Okay, great. And so what is our k-tilt? So this is, this is what k-tilt circ is. This is what the ring of integers in k-tilt circ is. So k-tilt would just be the fraction field of this, so it's a Laurent series field in one variable. Often I write it with lowercase t. Okay. But in the original, um, notion of k-tilt as being an inverse system over k, uh, this t ends up being just p, p1 over p, and so forth. Which means that in this um, sharp map from k-tilt to k, what is t-sharp? Well, it, it's just the first or zeroth coordinate, so t-sharp is just p. Right. That was one example. In another one, um, why don't we do the cyclotomic example very quickly? Ah, uh, well, hey, it works out very, very similarly. What I have to do, though, is identify some variable which is going to play the role of this capital T. And, you know, what I can do, this K contains roots of unity, 
1, zeta p, zeta p squared, and so forth, these all live in k, right? And so I can take them all together. Um, what I can do is subtract a 1 from all of them, excuse me. And these are no longer p power compatible, right? The p power of this is not this, but it is so modulo p. And so this constitutes an element of the inverse limit over Frobenius of k circ mod p. Uh, but that's OK. Um, this is uh, the ring of integers in the tilt by what we've just said. So we have, we've identified at least an element of this tilt, and why don't I call that element t? Then k tilt, being perfect, contains t and all of its p roots. And uh, t has to have the same absolute value as its sharp. What's its sharp? OK, this is a little more subtle. It's not 0. Only 0 has sharp 0. The sharp, we have to take lifts of it and do some kind of limit procedure to find out what the sharp is. And well, basically what you're doing is you're undoing whatever process is the homomorphism here. Anyway, T sharp, if you're following along, is this limit. Okay. And uh, this converges, <laughs> and it, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is what the sharp of t is. And it's, uh, it shows you that t sharp uh, it has absolute value between 0 and 1. So this t serves as a pseudo uniformizer for the field k tilt. And in fact, k tilt is going to be fp Laurent series t 1 over p infinity. Okay. Um, so just to note, we took two very distinct characteristic 0 perfectoid fields. And their tilts were isomorphic to each other. That can definitely happen. In the abstract sense, tilting isn't injective by any means. Okay. Right. Yes? Is that field the only one you can get for like characteristic B the with bounded? Oh, the question is, is the field of perfect Laurent series the only perfectoid field of characteristic P? No, I'll show you in a second that there are larger ones. But I, actually, one thing that was in my notes but I forgot to mention is that, <coughs> that this perfectoid field is actually contained in, or perfectoid field of characteristic P. So in a sense, it's kind of the initial one, although, yeah. Because any perfectoid field, a characteristic P contains a pseudo uniformizer, call that T, and then it contains FP, of course. And it contains all roots of T, and it's Tiatically complete, so, and, it, and it's also a field, so it has to contain this. <laughs> so in a way, this is sort of, whereas you, there's nothing like this in the characteristic zero world. OK, theorem about perfectoid fields. So this I might call the tilting equivalence. Um, the ideas for this go back to Fontaine, Advant, and Bourget. So let's say k is perfectoid. And let's say we have an algebraic extension of k. And I assume that it is finite and separable. So a finite separable extension of a field k, if it's perfectoid, part of the theorem says that this is also perfectoid. And so by design, the tilt is going to be some extension field of the tilt of k. And this extension field is also finite separable of the same degree. Uh, 
And this begins to set up an equivalence between finite separable extensions of k and that of k tilt, and that's the rest of the theorem. Therefore, well, the Galois theories of k and k tilt are the same. Finite separable extensions are the same category on either side, and we get that the Galois groups are the same. So the Galois group of k separable over k is isomorphic to the Galois group of k tilt separable over k tilt. Okay. Yeah, a remarkable theorem. And it's a theorem that underpins a lot of what's done in piatic Hodge theory, in particular the theory of phi gamma modules couldn't get off the ground if you didn't have a theorem like this. Yeah? Uh, are there non-separable finite extensions of k? Are there non-separable finite extensions of k? I was very careful to choose my, and in fact there's an error in the lecture notes when I didn't use the word separable. Anyway, if k is characteristic zero, of course every extension is separable. But I was <laughs> k, but k could be characteristic p, I suppose. And then sure, you could come up with unseparable extensions. Except no, you can't because k is perfect. So I should have written somewhere that this separability is automatic, but I'm being very careful in writing it now. <laughs> so uh, you're right. Instead of this separable, I could have just written it's a finite extension, right? In fact, you can go even further with this theorem and say for any a tall k algebra, if it's a finite a tall k algebra, then it's also perfected with algebra, but I haven't defined perfected with algebras yet. Right. Yeah, in the setting of Fontaine, Fontaine was interested in coming up with a more, a, a, an inseparable field of characteristic p corresponding to k and did that using the field of norms construction. But, yeah. yeah. OK. So uh, what does this imply? Oh, yeah. You know, if I took the field CP, which is defined to be the completion of the algebraic closure of QP, uh, well, I could also write this as K algebraic closure completed, where K is a one of these perfectoid fields in the middle. Yeah. So this CP is obtained by getting, taking K, which is a perfectoid field, and taking its algebraic closure. Um, what happens if I tilt these things? Well, algebraic extensions of K are the same as algebraic extensions of the tilt. And so this implies that the tilt of CP, well, I can now identify it with the, um, completion of the algebraic closure of K, tilt. And we've just learned that this is perfect Laurent series. Ooh, like so. So whatever the tilt of CP is, it's hard to pin it down exactly. It's not isomorphic to just this Laurent series field. In fact, it's what you get when you take the algebraic closure of that and take, a, take its completion. How do I know that that's not abstractly isomorphic to the same Laurent series field? Well, for one thing, the residue field is different. It's FP bar. And for another thing, the value group is different. It's Q rather than Z or something, right? It's an algebraic closed field. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So far, so good? All right. So, how is tilting undone? How is tilting undone in this theorem, and how is tilting undone generally? Well, first, let's do this kind of relative scenario. Um, so, I mean, this theorem prompts the question, given a finite extension of k tilt, how might we find the extension on the other side, the extension of k, whose tilt is L. All right. Well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to take a field of characteristic P and turn it into a field of characteristic zero. And how do we do anything along those lines? Well, we use VIT vectors. Well, OK, unless we're Peter and then we use the cotangent complex. We use <laughs> us mortals start using VIT vectors. So, um, so uh, recall that for a perfect ring R,
there exists this ring, the vit, the vit ring, Well, what properties does it have? So it's piatically complete. Uh, perfect ring of characteristic P, right? Uh, the vit ring modulo P, well, then you just recover R. And furthermore, there exists this map from R into W of R. And this is notated A goes to Teichmuller representative of A. And this map is a map of multiplicative monoids. And this map should remind you of the sharp map that we just covered, from something of characteristic P to something of characteristic zero, right? Okay, so these three properties, it's piatically complete, you modify P, you get R, and there's this, this map, um, and this map is a section to this guy. So, such that A modulo P, it's A and then, this vit ring will be universal for these three properties in the appropriate sense. And if you like, you can write down what elements of W of R look like there. Power series in P. In the right. But this presentation doesn't tell you at all how you add elements of this vit ring. For instance, how do you add two Teichmuller representatives? Well, there are formulas, and the formulas involve funny limit things. And actually, if you wind all of them, you start entering into constructions just like the limit processes that go into how you prove the theorems I just cited. Anyway. Oh, by the way, what's the vid ring of FP? It's ZP. Good thing to know. So, um, let's say uh, we have a perfectoid algebra. Let's say we have a sorry, perfectoid field K. So let's say K is a perfectoid field of characteristic zero. Then we can go ahead and form its tilt, and we can go ahead and form the vit ring attached to the tilt. So actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take the tilt and then take the ring of integers. Okay. So this is a perfect ring, so I'm allowed to apply vit vectors to it and still expect to have this kind of presentation for it. And, uh, and in fact, it's a topological ring. It's even a Huber ring. I talked about that yesterday. I gave an example. And I wanted to construct um, a field, I wanted to construct K from its tilt in a sense. So in fact, there's a ring homomorphism that works this way. So a typical element of here looks like this. And I can send it to the corresponding element of K. Well, how do I drag elements from this tilted field into K? I use the sharp map. Just a second. So I actually don't really care about K0 so much as I care about K. In K, P is invertible. So this ring homomorphism factors through this ring. And typical elements of this ring are like kind of Laurent series. Great. So this is a ring homomorphism one has to check. So let me call this thing theta K. In fact, it's a surjective homomorphism. And the kernel of it well it's obviously a maximal ideal but in fact the maximal ideal is principal. It's generated by a single element which I'll call Xi K. And Xi K takes the following form if I start writing it as a power series in P, its initial term will be a pseudo-uniformizer. And then there's everything that comes afterwards. So what I'm saying, these are all theorems. You can find them in Kedlyle-U, for instance, in vast generality. <laughs> so this Xi K, uh, what am I saying about it? Um, this is a pseudo-uniformizer. 
And this alpha is a unit in the vid ring. So in fact, this psi k, it lives here before I inverted p. Great, and so this is going to be an element in the kernel of this theta map, and in fact, it's going to generate that kernel. Let's do an example of this, shall we? If we have k, the first one we considered was this one. And we said that the tilt of k, oops, was this Laurent series field. And this contains an element t, whose sharp map is p, right? t is just the sequence of p power roots of p. And so how can we come up with an element which is in the kernel of this theta map? Well, theta of the Teichmuller representative of t is t sharp, so it's just p. So now we're looking for an element in the kernel. Easy. How about t minus p? Is that of this form? Absolutely, because t is a pseudo-uniformizer and negative 1 is a unit. Next example. How about we do the cyclotomic field? We, uh, mm, yeah, this time a little harder. We said we, we didn't quite identify the sharp in such an explicit way. What we do have inside of k-tilt, it contains an element I'll call epsilon. Right. right, this is a system of p-th power compatible elements of k. And so it belongs to k-tilt. And what's the sharp of it? Well, the sharp of it is just going to be 1. And so it's easy to talk about what the theta of this Teichmuller representative is. It's just 1. And so then, how can we come up with an element in the kernel of theta? Oh, I guess I should be labeling this theta k, theta k. <coughs> So certainly theta um, kills epsilon minus 1. Um, but unfortunately, that's not of this form. But the fix for this is to recognize that here's something else in the kernel. If I take a pth root of this element and I apply the sharp map to it, I also get 1. Um, so and I can divide this in here. <laughs> okay. So this is a bit funny. But if you play with it, you'll realize this is the correct thing to do. You have to take this quotient. Oh, I'm sorry. This does not. Did I say this lies in the kernel? No, it doesn't. And that's the whole point. <laughs> this lies in the kernel. This quotient, uh, well, this, you can write this out as 1 plus. That's this finite sum, if you like. And you hit this with theta, you'll get a sum of pth roots of unity, which is 0. So yeah, theta of this is 0. And some calculation shows this is primitive of degree 1, which is what this is called, this condition. Great. All right. So I asked how to recover the, uh, a, a field from its tilt. Well, in this relative setting, um, I can just say if, um, if we had some finite extension here and we wanted to recover the field in characteristic 0 whose tilt is L, well, here's how we might do it. We can take this vit ring. of l circ, And this is naturally an algebra over the Vitring of k-tilt circ. But then this algebra downstairs has a map to k itself via the theta map. And there you go. So that's how you recover l. Um, 
how you undo tilting in the setting of the tilting equivalents. Okay. All right, questions on that? So I answered this kind of relative question. Given a base perfectoid field K, algebraic extensions of it um, correspond to algebraic extensions of the tilt, and I've told you now how to go in both directions. But what about an absolute question? So if we have a, given a perfectoid field K of characteristic P, What are all of its untilts to characteristic zero? That is, can we describe the collection of perfectoid fields in characteristic zero whose tilt is k? Are there any? Well, um, and are they unique? Well, they're not unique. I just we've seen that the um, there are two distinct perfectoid fields of characteristic zero whose tilt is this Laurent series field in characteristic p. So there's at least two. <laughs> are there more? Well, it turns out that um, when, with, with, with regard to this theta map, you can come up with a many, many untilts of a given perfectoid field of characteristic P. So it turns out that there's an equivalence of this sort where um, ideals, of this, uh, ideals of this sort theta uh, generated by an element psi inside of W of K circ. This is primitive. These are in bijection with untilts. Primitive degree one. This is a somewhat of an answer to this question. If you know how to classify ideals inside of this vit ring, which are primitive of degree one, then you've classified the, unt the untilts. And the map just takes, well, if you have such an ideal, you can just send it to the vit ring, modulo that element. There you go. That's going to be a perfectoid field of characteristic zero whose tilt is what you started with. Great. But this is a slightly opaque. How do you identify elements that are primitive degree one? Well, it's easy to write them down. Much harder to do is decide whether two such ideals are the same. That's uh, algorithmically rather difficult. And conceptually, um, conceptually, like, uh, we'd, we'd much rather have some geometric object whose points classify the untilt, something like that, a moduli space, if you like. Okay. So I'm going to push along in this direction by suggesting a very alternate strategy. Um, and uh, for now, I'm going to assume that K, uh, the field we start with, is algebraically closed. So, and I'm even going to rename it as C to hammer it down. K equals C is algebraically closed. So it's an algebraically closed perfectoid field of characteristic P now. And let's suppose we have an untilt called C sharp to characteristic zero. Okay. And in characteristic zero, there are non-trivial piece power roots of unity, and you can choose a system of them. And when I take them in their totality, they constitute an element of the tilt but the tilt is just C. So we have an element of C now, which is a lot better than what we were doing before. We had an element of a vit ring. So somehow, given an untilt, we've now identified an element of the field C. Much better. Which field could it have been? Well, um, this element is sort of close to one. So in fact, it doesn't just live anywhere, any old place in C. It lives in, um, it's close to one. It's, one. it's in one plus MC, if you like. And what's nice about this is that this is a, this is a group <laughs> under multiplication. And that's going to be important because there was some ambiguity here when I did this. I could have chosen a different system of primitive p roots of unity, right? What would that have resulted in happening? 
that would have replaced each of these zeta p's by some power, and that would have resulted in replacing this element by a, oh, a translate by an element of zp cross. This isn't just a group. It's a zp cross module. Sorry, it's a zp module. Okay. And just to hammer down the fact that I'm, I'm considering this thing as an algebraic structure, why don't I let h be the multiplicative group, the formal multiplicative group. Oops. Um, maybe with base zp, whatever. So that um, h of the ring c circ is going to be 1 plus mc as a ZP module. Um, what's funny about this is that when we, do th when we do this with this ring, I mean, this is perfect. So elements of this group, the ZP module, always have piece roots, and those piece roots are unique. So this is a ZP module, which is P divisible. So in fact, it's not just a ZP module. It is a QP vector space. All right. Um, so what I can do is come up with untilts given elements of this vector space as long as they're non-zero. So I guess the last thing I'll say is this theorem, which is that untilts of C to characteristic zero are in bijection with the following set. I can take the formal multiplicative group of C circ. All that is is elements close to one, one plus the maximal ideal, considered as a ZP module. I'm going to puncture it, and then I'm going to mod out by the action of ZP cross. And so this theorem, this theorem, by the way, appears in the work of Farg and Fontaine. Okay. How does it go? Well, I told you how one direction goes. Given a C sharp, I construct this element, uh, I'll call it epsilon. I have to choose this element epsilon. This lives in H of C circ. It's not zero, uh, which is to say it's not one. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, ambiguous, but the ambiguity is resolved once I take the image in this quotient, right? How does it go the other way? Well, if I've got some random element epsilon of H of C circ and it's not zero, Well, what I'm going to do is form an element xi in the same way. I can just let xi, oh, I have to be very careful that it's not the same as epsilon. Uh, let xi be uh, this kind of Teichmuller representative. It's the same formula. And then what's my characteristic zero untilt? I take the vit vectors of C circ, I invert P, and I might up by this element. So um, I like this, because what we've done is we've identified on tilts with something that has a geometric flavor to it. This, is a, this H is a formal scheme, and so this is the points of a formal scheme. I have to take away zero, and then, okay, then I have to mod out by something that's quite interesting. <laughs> but it turns out you can give this sort of quotient a lot of cool geometric structure. Uh, as a preview, we'll be talking about in the later lectures about things called diamonds, which is a category which contains perfectoid spaces and allows for such quotients like this. Okay, I better stop there, thanks. Okay, any questions? Yes? Oh, right.
So you talked about this problem for characteristic zero on tilts. Are there any obstructions to doing it for characteristic P on tilts? Good question. I was hoping someone would ask that. What is the tilt of a characteristic P field? If K has characteristic P, then K tilt is the inverse limit under X goes to X to the P of K, but that's an isomorphism, an automorphism. So this is just K. The tilt of K is K itself, and so tilting is a um, projector, right? And uh, it's idempotent. And so the untilted characteristic P is just itself. And so what if I wanted to extend this theorem to all untilts, including this dumb one, which is just K itself? Well, then I shouldn't puncture. <laughs> it's remarkable how this all works. If I choose the identity element here, then my epsilon is just going to be 1, 1, 1 all the way through. And then when I do this construction to it, I actually get, okay, careful. I, I get 0 divided by 0. But that's not really what it is. It's this sum, right? And if epsilon is 1, what's the sum? It's p. And then what happens when I mod out by p here? Well, oh, yeah, okay, sorry. I should have modded out first and then inverted to make the formula work generally. But if you mod up by P first, guess what you get? You get C again. So it works perfectly. It's just that if you don't puncture, you end up with a very stacky point at the origin here. ZP cross acts freely after you puncture, but if you don't puncture, then, yeah. Other questions? Er So uh, the, the object you wrote down has a filtration, I guess, because it's 1 plus the maximal ideal. Oh. Um, um, so the I, object I wrote down has a filtration because it's 1 plus the maximal ideal. What's the filtration? Uh, just things that are con more and more congruent to 1. Um, if you were thinking this, can anyone come up with a problem why this well, might not be a good idea? Let's say multiplying by p, because that's... Well, the first problem is that this is just m, so that's no good. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's characteristic p. And we're in characteristic p, so multiplying by p. I mean, sure, you can filter it by uh, whatever the value group is, but go on with your question if there's Oh, OK. Well, maybe it was a bad question. But uh, I was just wondering if that filtration means anything about the untilt. Uh, does the filtration mean anything to the untilt? I guess, in a sense, you can give a structure to this, like a metric structure, where you can move towards the origin, that is, move towards the trivial on tilt in a, in a way. Um, well, we'll talk more about this object. Uh, this is sort of Farg Fontaine's curve. It's called the Y curve. There's also an X curve. Uh, in, in this setup, the Y curve contains, if, if we didn't puncture, it contains an origin, and then you can put some kind of metric on it, and you're moving towards that metric, in that metric, towards the origin. So sure, that will relate to this filtration. Okay, more questions? One, oh, there's one there. So you mentioned that uh, there's this minimal perfectoid field of characteristic P. Um, right. That's contained in any other. Um, in characteristic zero, that's clearly not the case. Those yeah. two examples you gave neither contains the other. Right. Is it true that any minimal perfectoid field of characteristic zero uh, tilts to the minimal perfectoid field of characteristic P? Uh, all right, these questions of minimality, right? What are the characteristic zero fields which tilt to this minimal one, this Laurent series field? I think that's one of the exercises I assigned in the projects. So maybe I shouldn't say too much. <laughs> OK, and on that note, we need a break. When do we resume, Bryden? Five minutes. Five. Thank <laughs> you.